Good morning, everybody. For our last class of the quarter, we are finishing up the discipleship class, and we are going to be rocketing through all the subjects that we discussed. It's good to put a summary at the end of the quarter just to kind of wrap up the things that we discussed three months ago, and so that's what we're going to be doing this morning. We'll be moving very quickly through this material this morning, but if you have a question or a comment, please throw something in Sandy. That will more than likely get my attention. Um, before we move any further, though, I want to make an announcement about the next quarter's classes. We discussed it a little bit on Wednesday night. Um, but just kind of preempt what we're going to be discussing. The workbooks are on the back bench, in case you haven't been able to pick one up. On Sunday morning, we are going to be discussing Faith by Works and Works by Faith, as you can tell underneath that. That's going to be a study on the book of James. This is one that I mentioned on Wednesday. I had another one planned for it and for next quarter, and then the quarter, or the, the end of the year survey that we always do, this was requested by five or six different people. So if you five or six people are out here, we're pushing that one back to allocate for your class that we're doing. We'll be doing a little bit different approach than that. I'm not a huge fan uh, of just kind of verse by verse studies. I don't like just kind of taking a verse and a verse and a verse. And so we broke it up a little bit differently. If you see the workbook, you know what I'm talking about. But to kind of summarize, I believe when you look at it, we'll discuss this more at length next week. I think you can look at James 1 as kind of being a summary for the entire book. I don't know if that's 100% accurate, there's going to be some leeways that we'll take with it, but more or less that's going to be the approach that we'll take to it. So if you look at the workbook, you kind of see where we're going to be going with it. And then on Wednesday night, what we're going to be discussing is more of a topical class. We're going to be discussing how do I respond, and this is a class that's geared around how do we respond when people ask or say kind of random things. How do we respond as a Christian? So one of them, I think this Wednesday, will be how do you respond when someone tells you that they're gay? How do you respond when somebody tells you that they want abortion? How do you respond when somebody tells you that they identify with the other gender? Kind of current topics is what we're going to be discussing. And all this geared around how do you respond as a Christian? I want to make one thing plain before moving further. I do not claim to be the foremost kind of chief of knowledge in all of this stuff. So this will be a very heavily conversational class. Many of you have had these conversations, and as I put in the workbook, all of these conversations that are in the workbook, all these topics, I've either had personally or I've had other people relate to me firsthand. And so these are not just topics that are pulled out of thin air. All of them are very real. I changed the name so that you don't want to get embarrassed. That didn't happen with anybody here in this conversation with people here. But those conversations are true. I do need to make another announcement real quick, and that's that the quarter is actually going to start this Wednesday. We move singing night from this Wednesday to next Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be on vacation. I'd like to say that there's some big reason why we're going to be doing that. We're not. We're going to be on vacation next week. So we're moving singing night from next Wednesday to this Wednesday. So if you're teaching class next quarter, that will begin on this Wednesday. I just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. I think that's all. And so now we're going to pick up and ask John to do a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for you being our Father and our God and sending Jesus to, to live among us and to teach us and to die for us and to resurrect for us, Father. Father, thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for the adoption as your children. Father, as we enter this, this time of Bible study, Help uh, Brady to, to give him your <coughs> wisdom and knowledge and understanding and that he may give us a good lesson. And Father, give us open minds and open hearts that we may be open to what Brady has to say to your word and let your word come into our lives and transform us into the kind of people you want us to be. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. As I mentioned, we are going to be finishing the discipleship class. I hope this has been advantageous to everybody this quarter. I've certainly enjoyed it. This is one of those classes that I haven't ever taught one. As I say, pretty much every quarter I've never taught one on it before. I've never sat in a discipleship class. And it has kind of a denominational ring to it, if you can let me use that phrase. Um, whenever I announced, I think last quarter we were talking about discipleship, there's a lot of people that kind of looked at it a little bit weird. Hopefully as we take a more biblical approach to it this quarter, it's kind of become clear what we're talking about. Discipleship is a very fundamental aspect of New Testament Christianity, but sometimes when you look at what the world has done with it, it means very weird and sometimes very non-Christian type stuff. But one thing I want us to get out of this class this quarter is that this is not a one-time thing. I think sometimes when we look at baptism, it's you're baptized and then you're not baptized, or you're baptized and that's it. I guess that's more accurate. Discipleship is not that way. It is kind of a state of continual growth. And that's pretty much the theme that we've been developing throughout the course of this entire quarter is that it's a process. 
Let me ask you the be all and end all question, though. What is a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple? A lot of these slides this morning will look very familiar. How are we? A follower. It is a follower, for sure, yeah. I guess we could just call the class right there, because that pretty much is, I guess, without putting too much words on it, that's pretty much what a disciple is. What is a disciple, though? Individual who learns. I heard four people at once. Yeah. Individuals learn from a master, and whenever they are done learning, they should resemble their master. Okay, a person who is following a master, and at the end of it, they should resemble their master? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. He's actually very well on the next slide. Is that what you Or so, as I just called you? Oh, friend. Lee, sorry, one of you people over here. I said someone that is disciplined and committed to the gospel. Right, someone who is disciplined and committed, that kind of folds into the nature of what we're talking about. Joe and Brent, did y'all have anything? Or, okay, just call me up for no reason. Does somebody else over here have something? Instrument. It's an instrument. What do you mean by that, Mark? It's a tool uh, that is endowed by God to carry out what God determines that person is going to do for him. Right, it's kind of a tool, an instrument, somebody who does what God wants them to do. That's the whole necessity and the nature of obedience, kind of in a nutshell. Yeah, that's more or less what it is. Now, all these, all these definitions that we've kind of put up, I think, speak to it. It's the idea of looking like your master. It's the idea of being disciplined and committed. It's the idea of obedience. Basically, is the way we define it at the beginning, is you have this student that's following a teacher. And as Zach mentioned, eventually you find yourself molded in the image of that person. That's the nature of not just being a disciple, but being a Christian. As you remember in Acts 11th chapter, this was kind of the first verse we started the entire quarter off with. It says that these people were called Christians at Antioch. Why were they called Christians at Antioch? students were resembling was Christ. So it made sense to associate right. them with who Christ was. Exactly. They resembled Christ. They said this is something that looks like Jesus. It sounds like Jesus. So these people are obviously following Jesus. We're going to call them of Jesus. They're Christians. So that's more or less what a disciple is. The problem with it is, is most people don't follow Jesus in this world. Who do they follow? Most people who call themselves Christians don't necessarily follow Jesus. Who do they follow? Or we follow sometimes. Sure. Okay, their pastor. You said that was so much disdain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people follow. That's true. We have three fantastic preachers who I love following. Yes, you're right. I mean, they pastors. Yes, sorry. They follow men. Right. They follow men. Yeah. Sometimes they do follow themselves. They don't follow. A, they don't follow a person. They don't follow God. They follow themselves. Yeah. man-made theology, or, to put it in layman's terms, sometimes they just follow a system. And I think that's really what most people follow. Most people do follow, you know, a person, well, I can't disagree with what John Stott says, so I'm going to follow John Stott no matter what he says. And you see that kind of just blind devotion, especially that Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians 3 when he says people say, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. It's just kind of this devotion to a person. Now, obviously, I'm of Jesus is the right one, but some people say, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. That's not the right attitude. Can we suffer from this? Or can we, as members of the church, fall into this trap as well? Absolutely. Yes, we can fall into this. Look at Galatians chapter 3. This is how we're going to begin this morning. And we'll kind of hit certain verses. We obviously looked at hundreds of verses throughout the course of this quarter, but we're just going to kind of snapshot a few of them as we go throughout the course of this morning. But in Galatians chapter 3, this follows, once again, the shock of the day, follows immediately after Galatians 2. What happens, though, in Galatians chapter 2? What happens at the end of it? This is a big confrontation between two apostles. <coughs> right, Paul confronts Peter. What does Paul confront Peter about? Withdrawing himself from the Gentiles out of Christians because, just because the Jews showed up. Right, Peter withdraws himself from the Gentiles because the Jews had showed up. What makes up the brunt of that argument? When Paul really gets in Peter's face about it, what does he tell him? <coughs> During Galatians 2. Because it spills over into chapter 3, but what's, what's the core of this speech? In this <laughs> He's getting onto him for being hypocritical, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. There's no delineation between Jews and Gentiles, which Peter should have understood considering he was there in Acts chapter 10, made a strong case in chapter 11. Yeah. What else makes up the core of this? Well, I think that these Jews were kind of the hypercritical type Jews that were were uh, they wanted they, they revered the law and they thought you know I think it was kind of a, where they were trying to impress on 
other people that they needed to follow the law. Yeah. In addition to being baptized. Right. And so when, when they got there, Peter goes, well, he, no, he withdrew. Yeah. And Paul says, look, you know, and I know, and the Jews know that it, you cannot follow the law perfectly. Right. And Jesus came to abolish the law. Yeah. So why are you going back to following the law when you know it's no good? Exactly. And that's pretty much what Galatians chapter 2 is about. If you mentioned the Judaizing teachers, they're certainly there at the beginning of chapter 2. They're in view in Galatians chapter 1. That's who Paul talks about when he says, you know, I didn't, I didn't come up with my gospel for man. I came up with God. You're trying to bind something that's not there. So when you look at Galatians chapter 2, and this is what John mentioned in verses 18 and 19, to me this is the crux of it, verses 18 and 19. If I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. That kind of goes with the whole discussion that we've had is that the Jews were trying to rebuild that wall. Not only, you know, should you follow Christ, but you should also follow Moses kind of in the same vein. That's not in view anymore. That's not the case anymore. That's what Paul's arguing for. So when you look into Galatians chapter 3, it kind of spills over into that. It says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Which I love that word for some reason. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish then? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do you do it by the works of the law, or do you do it by the hearing of the faith? What's the question that he's asking in Galatians 3? Because it goes really well with the topic in Galatians 2. What's the motivation? That's, that's a little bit of it. What's the rest of that question? When did you receive the, the Holy Spirit? Was it because of your works of the law, or was it because of after Christ died and he sent his promise that he would come? Right. Are you receiving your Holy Spiritual gifts and be able to work miracles because of the law that you're following? Right. Or because Christ died and and we're now under faith? Yeah, when did you receive the Holy Spirit? And kind of the subliminal question is when were you when were you saved? When did you know that you were you know acceptable by God? When were your sin washed away? When when did the process of conversion take place? And the Holy Spirit is the, the, the specific part of it, but really the question is, where does your salvation come from? That's what he's asking in verses 1 through 5. The answer is, of course, Jesus. It's not the works of the law. That's kind of the rhetorical answer to that. So what he's addressing here in Galatians chapter 3 is people who follow a system rather than follow Jesus. We're following the works of the old law. We're following what people have told us, but we're not really following Jesus. It's easy for them to fall into, and it's very easy for us to fall into every time we take our eyes off of what Jesus says. Are there any thoughts or comments on that? I'll ask that question about 400 more times this morning. So assume we pick up. All right, let me ask you this question then. Is it possible or should we have blind faith? If we're talking about following Jesus, does it mean that we just kind of have faith that's blind? This is a picture of the woman at the well. This is a real picture happening. Yeah, woman took it with her iPhone. Right. <laughs> right, okay. So we are instructed to search the scriptures. We're designed to look into the scriptures, right? Yeah. Right, the evidence, the evidence, Romans 1, I think Acts chapter 17, all these things, or maybe Acts 14, all these things are plainly seen. What happens when we begin to have blind faith? What happens for discipleship when we say it's blind? Right, it's, as, long as, as, as long as the keyword Jesus is thrown in there, we'll just blame everything. Yeah, I'm, t I'm not with you. Oh, Jesus, all right, now I'm with you 100%. Yeah. And that is true. That there are some people who look at it like that. Why is it wrong to have blind faith, though? I think we lose our effectiveness in defending it if we have blind faith. We absolutely lose our effectiveness. If somebody comes up to you and says, First Peter three verse fifteen, why do you believe this? And you say, Well, I don't really know. It's just kind of what I was taught, or it's what Joe or our pastor says. Then I don't really. That, that's you should even talk to them about it. If we can't defend it, if we don't know why we believe then our effectiveness in evangelism goes way downhill. There's also no depth to our faith. And we talked about that a little bit when we talked about the idea of um, believing something and actually being convicted of it. But there's no depth to our faith. If we don't have any roots, what happens to us in the day of persecution, the day of temptation, trial? So you can just lodge you from that faith. Right. Because you have no clue why you're holding to this in the first place. Right. If things get hard, it'll be the faith that goes first. Right. When the tough gets going... The, what happened? <laughs> when the going gets tough, the tough do not get, that was the worst. That was the I didn't even know I was saying as it was coming out of my mouth. 
But you're, I mean, you're right. And what Zach mentioned is exactly the definition of the parable of the rocky or the parable of the soils. You remember the rocky soils, the seed was thrown on it, what happened to it? It sprang up, but it didn't have any root exactly. And so when the sun scorched on it, it was basically gone. And you see this in John the fourth chapter. We discussed John chapter four at length when we looked at it um, in, the, in January. We discussed it in a sermon, I think, a few weeks ago. But when you look at John chapter four, verse thirty-nine, it says, "After the Samaritan, the Samaritan woman goes in the city, she brings all people out." It says in verse thirty-nine, "From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, saying, he told me all the things that I have done.'" When the Samaritans came to Jesus, verse forty, they were asking him to stay with them. He stayed there two more days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. If you look two chapters earlier in John chapter 1, you have the story of Philip and Nathaniel. Nathaniel's kind of unsure about this Jesus of Nazareth. What does Philip say? And I may be getting these names backwards. Just come and see. Just come and look for yourself. Take that step. Come and investigate Jesus for yourself. It's not right to have blind faith. And I think sometimes we... We kind of use that as an escape hatch. We say, well, faith is, you know, I, I don't understand everything about God. His ways are higher than our ways. The secret things can stay with him. I don't understand everything, so I'm just going to not study. That's not the idea of either one of those two passages. And I think this speaks to that. When we talk about discipleship, it also requires, as Lee mentioned, a very strong sense of commitment. You see this in Luke chapter 14, with the intensity, with the sacrifice, and with the dilution of our faith towards God. But the image right there of salt is the most important one that I want to gravitate towards. Salt cannot lose its flavor, as Luke chapter 14 talks about. How do we become unsalty, if that's a word? We're supposed to be the salt of the world. How do we lose our saltiness? Contamination. What's that? Contamination. Contamination, exactly. What do you mean by that? Overduly, unduly influenced by the world. Right, when we're unduly influenced by the world, right. When people come in and try to dilute what we're, what we're dealing with, yeah. And that really goes back to the nature of salt as a whole. And this was something either I learned and forgotten about or I didn't realize until this quarter. Is that salt never becomes unsalty. It's not as if they lose their salty properties. The problem is it becomes diluted when you take that same measure of salt in a much bigger vat of water. That's when it becomes diluted. And so if you take us and you put us in a world of temptation, a world of thought, a world of you know all these different theories, and we begin to portion them the same as Jesus, then our understanding of Jesus, our faith, becomes diluted. And so I think that's a little bit of what he mentions there in Luke 14 when he talks about losing your, uh, losing your saltiness. It's very apropos that Shell is the one that mentions or talks during this course or this quarter, this section, because he was the one that made the excellent chicken and bacon or chicken and pig commitment analogy many moons ago that I did not hear about. And I actually practiced it this week and I forgot about it. But if I remember right, a chicken is dedicated to breakfast, but a pig is committed. Is that not right? I even wrote it down. A chicken is involved. A chicken is involved, yes. A pig is committed. A pig is committed, exactly, because the pig gives everything of themselves. Those notes are absolutely worthless. So it requires commitment. Discipleship requires 110% towards God. If not, then we're going to be deluded. That's the whole point of what he talks about. Here's the question, though. And some, people will, some people will argue that I don't need to study anymore because I've been a Christian for 60, 70 plus years. Is there ever a point in our life when we can say, I know it all and I don't need to study? Luke was shaking his head long before I was done with that. How do we get to that point then? Because nobody would raise their hand and they say, well, I don't need to study anymore because I've got the basics down. I know baptism. I know I'm supposed to evangelize even if I don't always do it. I know I'm supposed to pray. I'm supposed to not get drunk or whatever it is. Why do we stop studying? <clears throat> yes, sorry. Uh, I'm, like, I'm like one of the because uh, we, we Yeah, we gradually, nobody ever wakes up on Sunday morning and says, you know what, I think I'm done with the Bible for today. I, I've already got it covered, I can blah, 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 and so I don't need to know anymore. Nobody makes that conscious decision, but as you mentioned, this kind of a drifting away from it, yeah. How do we start drifting away, Zach? I think one of the biggest things is when we stop talking about the Bible with other people. Yeah. Because something that I find that constantly drives my study is, just as there's, you know, 104 different opinions in here, as you talk to people in the world and you start talking about the Bible with them, you're going to run into new stuff all the time. So if you're actively trying to share the gospel with other people, and I don't mean, you know, on a 
say for how we didn't everybody was watching. But it just, it well, tell me more about that. Yeah. You're going to hear all kinds of stuff. And if we have a dedicated mission to saving other souls, mm -hmm. we're going to have to find some way to address that. And that means understanding and taking a, a more nuanced approach to some passage we may have been familiar with for 60 years. Ago. Right. Yeah, I would argue conversations like that are some of the best ways to evangelize. What do you think about this? What's this? What's your understanding of this passage? But in saying that, there needs to be a delineation between Bible study and Bible interpretation. Because I've said in Bible studies before where literally they open up the Bible and without even reading it, or reading a few verses, they say, well, what do you think about this? Is that Bible study? When you just ask the blanket question, what do you think about this? I've probably done it a few times, so maybe I'm a hypocrite. Is that Bible study when you just ask everyone's opinions? Right. It can be a good starting point, exactly. It can be a good way to kind of break the ice and see where everybody's at with it. But what is Bible study? Okay, study the Bible. Anybody <laughs> besides Howard have an answer? What is Bible study according to the rest of us? It's decoding and encoded message in the text. And what I mean by that is in communication, the only reason you're able to understand what I'm saying right now is because you can decode what the utterances I'm making. It's how language works. So whenever you look at a text, you can then say, okay, what did he mean by this? It's enabling because it communicates some kind of message to you. But it's constraining because certain words can only be used to mean certain things. So whenever you sit down and study the Bible, you're able to decode whatever that utterance is on that page in front of you to know what it actually means. That's true. And the more you get into it, the more you're able to kind of understand it between genres and verses that connect and parallels and symbols and all those different types of things. So there is a, there's a sense in which that's right. One thing, I, one delineation I want to do, I do want to make with this is that it doesn't matter when you're studying the Bible necessarily how many verses you read. I think sometimes we think in order to do proper Bible study, we have to read an entire book. And that's not always the case. If you look at John chapter 3 and verse 16, or if you look at you know, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22, you look at these individual verses, you can do Bible study by saying this goes with this, and where does this apply? What's the context of this verse? What is, why is this letter being written? That's what Bible study means, is when you get into the text, you start to analyze a little bit more. And that's really where it comes from. And that's why we put this mysterious kind of circle that just seems open-ended, is it begins with instruction. You can't do Bible study without getting into the text. You can't understand more about it unless you actually open it up. But then it becomes where you start to apply it. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 5, 11 through 13, that was the main problem with these people, is that they understood what the Word said, but what had they not done? They hadn't grown, but yeah, they hadn't applied it. They hadn't had their senses trained to discern good and evil by reason of use. That's what Hebrews chapter 5, 11 through 13 talks about. And then, of course, the last one is a full-on immersion in it. That's when you begin talking about it with other people. You start thinking about it more and more. You start to see, you know, when you, when you meditate on the days of creation, you see the, you know, the trees. You begin to think, well, you know, God did that. Or just making it a part of your everyday life. And it's just kind of this long, continuous cycle. Nobody ever gets to the point where they say, I don't really even need to study anymore. Then the question becomes after that is obedience. Do I need to obey? Do I not need to obey? What does most of the Calvinistic world think about obedience? You'll obey, but it's not like you had any part to play with. Right, they'll obey, but it's not as if you had any part to play with. It. That's just kind of God using you as a vehicle for it. Yeah. Your obedience is you select when you obey. Right, if I don't, if I obey, that's great. That means that's heaven 2.0. That's the VIP version of heaven. God's really happy with me. But if I don't, then God's grace will continually flow over me and it's all just taken care of. That is a part of the Calvinistic world of thinking of obedience. How else does the world think about obedience? Do they think it's necessary? John 3, 6. The first part. Okay, not the second half. Just the first part. Yeah. Well, but it's the way they interpret the second half. But if you believe in Jesus, mm -hmm. and you say somebody says, do you believe in Jesus? Mm -hmm. And you say, yes, I believe in Jesus, then you, you're a Christian. Um, right. There's nothing else. Right, and that is, especially in modern evangelical version of it, if you, if you go back to the you know, pre-60s when you talk about hard shell Baptists, they don't believe that at all. It's a completely different type of thing. But you're right. Modern day idea of John 3, 16, held up in the end zone, as long as you do, as long as you both believe, everything else is taken care of. And that's not, that's not what that verse means at all. I would argue with you pre-60s hard shell Baptists. That's what they believe. 
You know, okay. they have their own thing, but, but that's, I mean, you're still mm -hmm. supposed to go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, mm -hmm. but that's the crux of, is it not not correct? That's the crux of I was hoping for a chime in from Ken over there, too, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's why I said it, is because I know we have people here from that background, and that's my understanding of it, and even at that, it's still, there's still toe a much harder line than people today do, in, in a whole lot of ways, yeah. Most, most of the world thinks obedience is something that happens you know, after you've already saved. It's just kind of a natural result of your salvation. And that's not the way the scriptures really teach it. If you look, for instance, at this picture, which is beautiful, but if you look at this picture of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, why did Abraham even have to sacrifice Isaac or go to Mount Moriah in the first place? God told him to, exactly. But what, at what point did God stop him? He didn't stop him after he laid the wood. Right. If I remember right, it's when, and maybe I'm just traumatizing this in my mind, it's when Abraham raises the knife. That's when the angel calls out and stays his hand. He doesn't reach down and grab his wrist, as I think most paintings depicted. But he does kind of call out to him after he's well into the process of doing that. There's a speech that happens after it. But if you look at James chapter 2, it, it talks a little bit more about this nature of faith. We'll talk in great detail about James 2 when we get to it next quarter. Actually, maybe not next Sunday, but a few Sundays from now. But when you look at James chapter 2, starting in verse 19... He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. I love just the slightly sarcastic tone that he takes there. And verse 20, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He was then called the friend of God. That's a very underrated passage um, in this section. We look at James 2, we exhaust all the verses of it, kind of to the nth degree. But that phrase that he mentions there at the end of verse 23 is important when it says that he was called the friend of God. Why does he call him the friend of God? Because he knew. Right, because he knew him? Right. They had a relationship. Right, they had a relationship. I think that's getting a little closer to it, Ken. Christ said, if you're my friend, you'll keep my commandments. Exactly. And that's the meat of this section. If you're my friends, you do what I command you. Or you're my disciples, you're my friends, if you do what I command you to. But even within the James ecosystem, he still delves into it again. If you look at James chapter 4, he says in verse 1, actually he says in verse 4 rather, or verse 3, I'll get there eventually. No, just verse 4. I'm looking at it right here. Look at just verse 4. You adulteresses do not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What's this James bring out about the nature of friendship with God? Give up. 
And these more, the, the other things were more willing choices. He did give up everything. You're right. I was looking for more specificity. You know. You're right. Right. Bingo. Exactly. First Corinthians chapter 8, he says, Do I not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the rest of the apostles? And the answer to that is yes. Then he mentions that same chapter, Do I not have the right to be paid? The answer is yes. Then he mentions later, he says, If meat caused my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again. Does he have the right to eat meat? Yes. Why does he not take those things? Why is he not married? Why does he not get paid? Why does he have or keep himself from meat? Why does he do those things? Right. He was so intensely focused, right. And that's not to say that in order to be a true Christian, you have to give up all those things. That's not the point at all. The point is, is when you have your eyes on the prize, you're willing to sacrifice so many things simply just to, just to get that thing that you're shooting towards. So life as Christians, what do we give up and how do we discipline ourselves to attain that prize? How do we discipline ourselves? Or what do we discipline ourselves from? We have to distance, our, distance ourselves from just about anything where we would have to compromise our morals in order to move ahead and be what the world would call successful. Right, which is a very nebulous type of statement. There's a lot of things underneath that umbrella, but I think that's a good way to summarize it. Anything that's going to compromise our morals, anything that's going to compromise our souls, right. What else do we have to discipline? Or how else do we have to discipline? It does, I know. Zach just ruined everything. <laughs> well, so how else do we have to discipline ourselves? Let's get specific then. So if you want to get a promotion at work, and that may mean... I can't get a promotion at work. Well, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, if you're going to, say, chase a promotion at work or something like that, and you know that your boss or the people in control of that mm -hmm. are drinking buddies, and you know, in order for me to rub shoulders with this guy, I should probably go to these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That would be an example of compromising the morals. So that would be an example. Uh, pursuit of more money would be another example. Um, just wanting to be happy in this world. Yeah. You know, you may sacrifice, or, or rather not sacrifice, you would indulge yourself in ignoring whatever God said about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, mm -hmm. and do what you want to do. Yeah, and there are lots of people that do that. They say, well, I don't care what God says, I'm just going to do kind of what I feel like, which is the very opposite of discipline. But even, and all those are good examples, even when you take it and maybe in terms of an aggressive stance instead of withholding, sometimes you may say, well, I know that talking to my brother about a sin is not really my thing, that makes me uncomfortable. I'm going to discipline myself, push back my feelings, and just do it because I know it needs to be done. Same can be said about evangelism. So discipline doesn't necessarily mean sometimes an external sense. Sometimes it can mean a very internal sense. I'm, I'm disciplining my natural impulse, which is to just kind of shrink back inside myself. And I'm going to put myself out there and actually try to spread the gospel, try to talk to other people. I think all those things can come into play as well. <coughs> because we're doing that, because we're disciplining ourselves, because we're obedient, by nature we're going to look different. This is not something, as I mentioned then, that I, that I came up with myself. I'm not nearly this creative. <clears throat> but the idea of looking different is something that is repeated throughout Scripture, and most especially in, in Peter's epistle. Peter talks about the nature of looking different all over the place, which he should know how that feels. But we look different in regards to the cross. It's not just a symbol. It's something we're striving towards. We're different in terms of obedience, decisions, our focus, our prayer life, our approach to Scripture, and especially our in eternal impact. We look different in regards to all of those types of things. How does the standard quote-unquote Christian look in today's world? Somebody calls themselves, a, and I know that's a huge statement by itself, but how does the standard Christian look in today's world? Of which, what is it, 60% of Americans claim to be Christian. Not religious, Christian. They believe in God, they can quote John 3, 16, and on occasion, some point in that year, they're going to go to a church of their choice, depending on, may not even be the same one they go to the church. And uh, that's pretty much what the world's going to say. Yeah, they're a Christian and you can't attack. Right. And I think, and you're exactly right, most of them will say they're a Christian. And for a lot of people, that's where it stops. Because if you say you're a Christian and somebody comes back, well, no, you're not, then automatically it's, well, I can't blame you, judge me. You don't know my heart. You don't know my relationship with God. Well, it's pretty obvious from your life that there is no relationship with God. 
And I'm speaking in very broad terms, obviously. And, and before we talk about them, this is once again something that can be with us. If we don't look different, if we don't act different, think different, speak different than the world, then we've got to wonder how much we are devoted to Christ. And that's that's a question for introspection. But most of the world doesn't says they're Christian, but they don't act like a Christian. Or, you know, a lot of people do, but they don't act like it. So we look different. And that's what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 talks about. We quoted earlier. At, when people ask you for the hope that is within you, tell them. But he also mentions, I think, in 1 Peter chapter 4, that people are going to look at your life and the fact that you don't run the same dissipation with them, and they're going to do what? They're going to malign you. They're going to say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you come with us? 2 Peter 3 talks about the exact same thing in terms of Judgment Day. Where is the promise of this coming? You talk about it, but where is the promise of this coming? So Peter, in both epistles, really dives into this nature of looking different. And that's the one thing that Peter shares that not a lot of people, not a lot of the other epistles kind of have in store with it. But then it all go back, goes back to sacrifice as well. What am I trying to sacrifice? What am I disciplining in order to become closer to God? Because all of us are going to have to discipline and sacrifice things in order to be closer to Him. Whether that's the world, whether that's our own pursuits. And that's the nature, once again, of sacrifice. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24 and 24 is my favorite verse on this. What's the context of this chapter? Though? What's happening in 2 Samuel chapter 24? It's the very end of David's life. Right. How are you any different? 
The Gentiles do that. And so when you look at godly love, what does godly love consist of? Not just loving those who love you. Pat me on the back, pat you on the back. Loving your enemies. Loving your enemies, exactly. Which, and praying for them. And right. Blessing them and, and uh, offering them help. Right. If they need help. And right. And going beyond what you right. would do uh, if you were not mm -hmm. a, a follower of God. Right. It extends beyond just what can you do for me or, you know, how, how do you help me in the past? I can't remember who said it, but somebody says, somebody said the way that a man treats someone who can do absolutely nothing for him is the true test of character. And I think that's a fantastic quote. And do it, yes, that's the part that I forgot. I'm awesome at quoting today. Yes, Jim? Compare it to a parent's love for a child. Mm -hmm. It's unconditional. Right. Which Jesus will talk about, I think, even there in that section, Matthew chapter 5. If your son asks you for a, a piece of bread, you're not going to give him a stone. I mean, it just makes sense. So if God's going to do that for you, or if your own father would do that for you, how much more will God do that for you in terms of forgiveness and stuff like that? Of course, all of this, when we start talking about love, and this is dipping into the more emotional component of what it means to be discipleship, it goes into what our worship and it affects our worship when we have gathered on Sundays, when we gather on Wednesdays, when we read our Bible. But worship does a lot of things for us. It implants truth in our heart. It gives us words for expression. You see that all throughout the book of Psalms. You give words for all sorts of different types of emotions, from joy to pain to betrayal to love to forgiveness. The gamut of emotions is covered in the book of Psalms. It also gives us things to fight spiritual battles. Our worship is designed not just to kind of be something that we do and offer to God and that's that. It's, it's designed to help us in a lot of ways. And you see that all throughout Scripture, but you especially see that every time we come together. And I love what Psalm 95 verse 6 talks about. The very, black, or the very basic reason you should worship God is why? Because He is our God. Because He created us. Exactly. If nothing else, we should worship God because He put breath into our bodies. He deserves our worship and our adoration for nothing else just because of that. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments? I actually haven't asked that in a long time. I thought it would be until like 438 by now. Okay, when we talk about worship, we then go obviously into the idea of hope. And what we talked about a few weeks ago about what we're looking forward towards, my dad is smiling because me and him are on the same wavelength, weirdly, on this. But what should we be looking forward to in the eternal life? <coughs> you just answer my own question there. But what should we be looking forward to after this world is over? Living with God. Living with God, exactly. Now, you ask that to most people, what should we be looking forward to the life you're after? What would they say? When I die, I want to win. I want heaven, exactly. What's the problem with wanting heaven as opposed to wanting a life with God? That's how it is. Because it's a place where you can go fishing. Yeah. <laughs> you play golf, ride your four wheeler, obviously mud in heaven. That'll make a lot of Southern people happy, yeah. <laughs> Right, when we look at it, we're looking at it in those terms, it's I'm achieving something, right? I'm basically paralleling my life on earth within heaven. And that's not what heaven is. I mean, it's not any of those types of things. Ultimately, our desire is not to be with heaven, it's what? It's to be with God, exactly. And when that becomes our main motivation for obedience and sacrificing, and discipline, and evangelizing, all the things we talked about, that's when we know we're on the track towards God. And that's, that's the thing that oftentimes is overlooked in this. And you see this in Philippians 1, 23 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Paul wasn't looking forward to motor lacrosse. He wasn't looking forward to fantasy football. What was he looking forward to? He was looking forward to being with God, exactly. And that's what we need to be pushing towards. That drives everything about our life. It drives everything about our devotion. And it really drives our discipleship. Discipleship is about looking like God. The natural culmination of that is found in a life with Him. So eternally, of course, we also have evangelism. Evangelism is not optional. How then are they going to call unless in Him whom they have not believed? How will they not believe unless they have what? How must they not believe unless they have a teacher? And how will they teach unless they have what? Unless they are sent. Exactly. And as Joe so always points out, it's not just a position or not a job just for the guy that you pay to do it, but who is it a job for? Everyone who names the name. Sandra, exactly. Nobody else except for Sandra. Right? <laughs> Go ahead, Zach. Everyone that names the name of Christian. Right. Everyone claim to be that. We need to be Right. Everyone who names the name of Christian is designed to be an evangelist in some form or fashion, but especially if we learn nothing else, especially Sandra. Right. Um, so the whole point of this discipleship class, as we mentioned at the beginning, is to see it as a growth process. And hopefully that's been made clear throughout the course of this. You know, we say we're a disciple, but what does that mean? What does that entail? Especially in everyday life, what does that consist of? Well, it consists of being convinced about something. 
It entails of being committed, learning, always learning, always obedient, disciplined in regards to our daily life, looking different, sacrificing things, loving God, worshiping Him constantly, anticipating heaven, and then going out in the world to spread that life towards other people. In Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, Jesus says, Go ye into the world and do what? Not baptize people. Teach them and what? Uh, yes, teach them to observe everything I commanded you, but make what? Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Discipleship is what he wants us to create. That's what we need to be, and that's what we need to go about doing. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments on any of this? I think that's the first one I've ever got in the last quarter. Thank you, everybody.